Hello. Welcome to Indigenous Poetry, Language as a Map Home, a program in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Jane Pulo, Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple of notes before I hand the program over to our speakers. Please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize using the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our bookseller for this event, New Dominion Bookshop, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full, our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Many thanks to our partners, American Indian and Indigenous Community Center at Virginia Tech and the Muse Writers Center in Norfolk for sharing information about this event. We also greatly appreciate the support of all festival sponsors, donors, and community partners. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator who will introduce our featured authors. Lauren K. Elaine has written two collections of poetry, Difficult Fruit and Honeyfish, and co-edited Furious Flower, Seeding the Future of African-American Poetry. Lauren is an associate professor of English at James Madison University and assistant director of the Furious Flower Poetry Center. Thank you all for joining us today. Lauren, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Jane, and thank you so much to the Virginia Festival of the Book and um, all of the organizers. I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel, Indigenous Poetry, Language as a Map Home. And our first poet tonight is Ben Kingsley, author of Demos, An American Multitude. Who, he belongs to the Onondaga Nation. He's the author of two more books in the past four years, Not Your Mama's Melting Pot and Colonize Me. He's a recipient of the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, Kundiman and Tickner Fellowships. Um, and his work appears in Poetry, The Kenyan Review, Oxford American, among others. Kingsley is an assistant professor at Old Dominion University and will be reading for a short while for us. Welcome, Ben. Hey, thank you so much. Let me start my little timer here so I don't go over time. Let me first begin by thanking Lauren so much for that introduction and also plugging her new book, Honeyfish. You can see it here, winner of the 2018 Green Rose Prize uh, for a reason. Um, I'm gonna start by reading, oh, I also wanna say, shout out Tracy, I see you. I'm excited to see you on Monday. Um, I'm gonna start out with the, there, there's actually a section in my book, um, the acknowledgement section, which is very, very common, um, but I made sure that mine came before anything else in this book, and you'll see why in a second. I'm actually going to read from it. Uh, this feels very show and tell, um, but this is a picture um, of my grandmother, Matsumi Hasebe, um, and she is in a prison cell, a jail cell in the picture, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but the section is, thank you firstly to my Obasan grandmother, Matsumi Hasebe, who taught me that if a tyrant's narrative can be a well-formed prison, a poem can be a creature of protesting fire inside of that prison. Thank you to your father, Naka Hasebe, so my, my great-grandfather, uh, his fire, his poem that would put him behind the exactness of these very wooden bars, see the warhorse cry, he wrote in defiance of an imperialist Axis nation's sun god, uh, which was Emperor Hirohito. And under the picture, it has Matsumi Hasebe, my grandmother's name, January 4th, 1989. Uh, so the year before I was born, and that takes place in uh, Tomei Police Station. I was not born in the police station. The photo takes place in the, in the police station. Um, 
And right after that, uh, I give a little bit of exposition about uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather's imprisonment. And uh, I write, the political prisoners greatly feared a fire as they would surely burn alive inside their wooden cages. Many of their homes had already been burned including my grandmother's childhood home in the capital F fire, capital B bombing of Tokyo, the single most destructive bombing raid in human history, such great American butchery that bomber pilots had to apply oxygen masks to keep from vomiting as they were hit by the reek of burning flesh, charcoal corpses and clouds of civilian blood. The first poem in the collection, I'm gonna read the first two poems and then maybe skip around just a little bit with the rest of my time. Um, the first poem is called American Multitude. I'm trying to, you know, riff off of that, you know, Whitman, I Contain Multitudes, um, kind of a, you know, poetry jam that we got going on along, on very, very often. So it's called American Multitude uh, from the languages of my Haudenosaunee Onondaga Nation. As everything begins with the heart beat of horses, a tribe the thudded color of all creation, my people gather, brindle as if the night were drizzled long across their backs. She of sickle sword, of tendon and tusk, he who wields the ox goad, fresh jawbone from a filly in heat, they who buck the binary. To Kenny Jonijura, too spirited, a young soul miracles, how many? How many ghosts can fit inside my people? Gather brindle as if the night were not yet gelded. My people gather as if the night were a suckling for the saber toothed drum, the whistle of pipes crescentic and long, hatchet my people, gather as if the night were only a splintered thing, bent about the glory of our now dawning home. The second poem is called Nantucket Sleigh Ride, and I hope you're thinking uh, WTF is a Nantucket Sleigh Ride, uh, and we'll get into that right away. So it starts with a quote uh, by Browning Tyler, grandson of a Nantucket whaler, 81 years old. When you harpoon a whale, it bucks harder than a freight train off rails. It dives down deep as it can go and takes your boat with it fast. And that's the sleigh ride, that last fighting gasp of Leviathan through sea. You know the whale metaphor. You know all about the beaten horse. Write this off as just another dead animal poem. Or dying, know that my people weren't neatly arced by America two by two. White boys named Noah harpooned our asses by the tens, by the thousands collared our necks with barbs and slugged lead into our heads when we bucked. They dove in after our oil and the good fat of our plains from sea to shining sea. Now here we all are, a tangle of corpses. Together we crabs in a clawed bucket list cross off every other kind and colony, colonize the crevice between my brown lungs, cremate me in ashy anonymity before I surface, I breathe, I war. All right, the next poem, um, before I moved to Virginia, I lived in Baltimore uh, and I lived in West Baltimore. So if you're familiar with, um, I almost said The Office, but that couldn't be farther from what I meant. The Wire, if you've seen The Wire, The Wire was filmed there. Um, I lived about two blocks away from where the Freddie Gray riots took place. 
Um, and one night I kind of open up my blinds uh, and I see uh, a bunch of kids basically trying to pull the hood ornament off of my shitty car. Um, but have no fear, the car was very, very shitty. Um, the title is Out My Apartment Window, West Baltimore, August 2 a.m. I spread the blinds with sleepy fingers, three boys and a lookout fourth, none old enough to drive the car they're prowling around. My Marlboro colored sedan, a Benz 20 something years old and seated atop bald wheels, soggy under the weight of rain and faded parking lot lights. I think more and more, she's the one thing my father left me I've ever really used. It's a hell of a time they're having attempt after attempt to pry the ornament from hood, paint peeled and chipped enough to reveal the gray of stone beneath. Five minutes of sneakers mounted on her grill and a flurry of whimpering tugs, a real sword in the stone scenario. I lay back down in bed and hope within an anvil of heart that one boy will free the silver and to him it will be Excalibur and he will brandish the star, the ornament, the sword long as a boy can. Understand there is no outstretched arm, no lady hidden in a crystal misted lake. Every old white wizard would see you burned alive. Here, no Merlin will shoulder the spell of all your weight. With your own arm, you cut. With your own arm, you take. Here, we get after our own. From the gray of stones, we pry, we pull each jewel of light. Here we forge our own bodies laid long upon the anvil of this street. And the next poem also has to do with a location. Um, like I said, I was living in Baltimore and I hadn't been to my hometown of Harrisburg, uh, PA, so like central Pennsylvania for quite some time. And so um, I came home and I'm going out to drinks with with friends and there's this kind of one um, one street that everybody goes down in Harrisburg. It's called Second Street. Um, so I'm looking for a bathroom um, and <laughs> I end up getting uh, pepper sprayed in the face by a police officer. Um, and I don't have time to go into the story um, but, you know, I got this damn poem out of it. Um, so you'll have to do a little bit of reading between the lines. Um, but the poem is called Run Home Boy, 2nd Street, Harrisburg, PA, Summertime 17. Bullshit. Watch your sister be arrested for daring to dance. Her Jay stunting across the street. Be next to her, but say nothing, because this ain't footloose, and you will always be a coward. Instead, just be thankful for iPhones filming, for women with stronger forearms, for men with bigger voices. Think instead about your next drink. Don't be thinking about every other time you were not brave. Don't be thinking, I'm a teacher. Sometimes I even smile at cops. I can win this one over with kind reason. He is bald, white, short. His uniform has come untucked. Be close enough to see cliche. Sweat on his upper lip. Be brave, be brave, you think, about anything but boot, scrape, baton, clatter, police grade mace, your own knees crunch against storefront signpost. Stumbling away, I could be blind. What if I am blind forever? You think, why am I mouthing? Excuse me, sir. 
Okay. Um, this next poem is called, it's a very, um, it's a poem about poetry, right? As so many poems are. And it's called, write about being triracial, says that guy from workshop. Um, and because I am, uh, you know, mixed, mixed race, right? On my mother's side, Onondaga and Japanese, on my father's side, Cuban and Appalachian, um, I don't really fit in neatly to our kind of, um, you know, uh, our sometimes very, um, how would I say it, well-defined intersectional categories, right? And so because I'm in this semi-liminal space, um, I very often get told, you know, what I should write about, what I shouldn't write about, et cetera. And this poem is called, Write About Being Triracial, says that guy from Workshop. I was born what I am in ash, under cigarette flick, bellied beneath PA roadside diner bulbs. I was born cooking leftover ingredients, a little of this, a little of half of a half. I was born scraps stirred see-through in Pyrex. I was born dribbled from God's measuring, cracked lip I was. Born runny, eggs in a black skillet, though I was not yellow enough for yolk, not black enough to be burnt, not even brown enough to be sizzle whispered all the way. I was born trying to pass off the problem of not being born a breakfast food at all. My hatred of egg whites, the worst, their glueiness stuck in the front of my throat. In the consonants of my captors, you shake your head, you say, Race is not extended food metaphor. I say, what if it's true I was born in the morning on a cold bed of coffee grounds, crawling on eggshells, I say, you tell me how I was born, what I am. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ben, for that wonderful reading. I can't wait to talk to you about this book afterwards. But up now, we have Lisa Igloria, um, author of Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, a co-recipient of the 2020 Crab Orchard Poetry Open, 13 other books of poetry, and four chapbooks. She's originally from Baguio City. She's also received the 2015 Resurgence Poetry Prize and the 2014 May Swenson Prize. In July of 2020, Governor Northam wisely appointed her for a two-year term as the 20th Poet Laureate of Virginia. She teaches on the faculty of the MFA Creative Writing Program at Old Dominion University. Um, one of Lisa's poems has been produced in broadside form for an exhibit set um, called Voiceovers, work that confronts racism, sexism, and bias in our experienced environments. Um, the full set of bro voiceover broadsides will be displayed in venues throughout Virginia when it's possible. Um, but as she reads the poem that she has in this selection, um, we'll have the broadside displays. I believe that's the poem that uh, Lisa will close with. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's a pleasure to be with you here. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Thank you, Jane, for the invitation to participate in this year's Festival of the Book. And thank you to the Virginia Humanities and Virginia Center for the Book. I wanted to preface my reading by sharing a little something about my relationship to indigeneity, which is the theme of the panel. And it's a subject that many writers are addressing today. And in a general or loose sense, indigenous simply means from or associated with a place. For instance, cinnamon is indigenous to the West Indies, or I've been described as a person indigenous to the Philippines, which is the country of my birth. More accurately though, indigenous means the earliest known inhabitants of a geographical region in contrast to eventual settlers, immigrants, and colonizers. And the implication is that most indigenous populations want to keep their independence and their sense of identity distinct from colonial and eventually mainstream culture. So in the Philippines, there are close to 180 ethno-linguistic groups or, or nations. Um, and when the Spanish arrived, they thought they were in the East Indies. And so they called the natives they met Indios, thereby lumping them with other populations called Indian. 
I grew up in Baguio City in Benguet Province, and historically, this is home to indigenous Ibaloy and Kankanai tribes. My own family, though, are Ilocano, the third or fourth largest ethno-linguistic group in the Philippines, occupying the coastal plains in the Northwest. With Spanish colonization in the 1500s, many Ilocanos were Christianized and assimilated. But because of the rugged terrain, most tribes in the northern Cordillera, where Baguio is located, were able to resist Spanish incursion. And the Spanish gave them the collective name Igorot. They were giving away lots of free names, right? Meaning people from the mountains, conflating their distinct identities into one dismissive designation. So in terms of indigenous identity, I'm Ilocano. I am from Baguio, but I do not have Igorot roots. And this is an important distinction for me. Uh, so during the American period, Baguio was turned into a colonial hill station, displacing indigenous communities farther, and they moved farther into the mountains. And along with Americans, lowland Filipinos increasingly influenced by colonial ideology, also considered Igorot savage or uncivilized. One more thing, um, more than 1,100 indigenous Filipino bodies were brought to the World's Fair in 1904 in St. Louis, Missouri, where they were live exhibits alongside indigenous Ainu from Japan, Egyptians, and American Indians. Now, people in the Philippine exhibits were from different ethnic groups, and most of them had not even had direct contact with each other until then. And yet all of them were thought of as just natives, as barbaric and savage uh, as other and their visual displays were meant to perform or validate the so-called um, moral imperatives and justifications for American manifest destiny. So uh, in the late 19th century also, a cohort of Filipino writers and artists, including the Philippine national hero Jose Rizal, had acquired some mobility and they were able to travel to Europe where they saw Buffalo Bill's traveling Wild West show. And observing American Indians or American Indios, they were inspired to call themselves Los Indios Bravos, thereby reclaiming the originally pejorative Indio and transforming its energy. So in doing so, they also declared a symbolic alliance with American Indians who like Filipinos had borne the brunt of US military tactics of subjugation. So I will begin my reading with a poem from an older collection, my very first poetry collection, actually, uh, a book called Cartography, published in Manila in 1992 by Anvil. And the only thing you need to know is that the speaker in the poem is an Igorot woman who has been given a Christian name by Americans. And this is The Secret Language. I have learned your speech, fair stranger, for you, I have oiled my hair and coiled it tight into a braid as thick and beautiful as the serpent in your story of Eden. For you, I have covered my breasts and hidden among the folds of my surrendered inheritance, the beads I have worn since girlhood. It is 50 years now since the day my father took me to the school in Bois a headman's terrified peace gift in the doorway. The teacher stood, her hair the bleached collar of corn, watching with bird eyes. Now I am Christina. I am told I can make lace fine enough to lay upon the altar of a cathedral in Europe. But this is a place that I will never see. I cook for tourists at an inn, they praise my lemon pie and my English, which they say is faultless. I smile and look past the window, imagining fathers and grandfathers cattle grazing by the smoke trees. But it is evening and these are ghosts. In the night when I am alone at last, I lie uncorseted upon the iron bed composing my lost beads over my chest, dreaming back each flecked and opalescent collar, crooning the names along with mine. Binaay, 
Bina Ai. Now I'll read some poems from the new book Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, and I just realized I've been writing about ghosts for a long time. Uh, and in this book, I also continue to address the tectonic effects of Filipino colonial histories. So uh, the idea of return is very scintillating and attractive. And for people of color who've never been made to feel completely welcome in America, uh, the idea of home is a very tenuous idea sometimes. But perhaps art and poetry provide alternative vantage point, points or shelter for those like us trying to build and sustain a life in the diaspora. So I will read the title poem, Maps for Migrants and Ghosts. And there is an epigraph from James A.H. White. Ask me where I'm from, and I may point at the dirt as if it were the embodiment of all things. Maps for migrants and ghosts. Are there little fish swimming in jars of brine in the cupboard? Are there pickled moons and stars, curtains of smoke after fireworks festivals, when dancers ripple into the streets to show off their ink. In that other world, we wait for tinny bell chime and scrape a foot pedal, the call of the scissors grinder widening through sleepy towns, heat rising from the heads of school children at three in the afternoon, yeasty like bread. The stronger the scent, the better. Even the gods and ancestors should thrive in other places, though they don't understand the need for gendered pronouns. They resent filling out forms which could be used to make claims for erasing their existence. Oh, pity you poor collectors of blunt throwaway instruments. Penitents inch toward the river, the expert thwack of bamboo whips calling forth the blood. There are questions that could never be answered. Like stars, at the heart of every place, a central note is buried. Say, anise. Say, achuete oil. Say, hair singed off the belly of a thrashing pig. And the next poem is a poem called, When I Think I Could Be Beautiful. Though I too live in a blur of worlds, I am one shade of brown, my blood not as obviously mixed. Who gave me this nose? I have no dimples. I have a brow broad as a page. The eyes tell when I am smiling, and eyebrows con constitute a language of their own. Never asleep, they are two republics separated by a bridge. Do you know the power of discarded fish bones? I know delight can interchange with dilate. I've strung the dried stumps of my daughter's birth cords on a safety pin. This is one way I keep them close. Do you know the sound the tin bucket makes, the shape of its mouth as it looks at the sky from inside the well. In the birdhouse made from hollowed out wood, wasps coming and going. They are not angry yet, only nesting. The ginger flower's torch burns with scent in the middle of the garden. Not even the rain can put it out. I will read, um, Two more short poems from Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, Song of Meridians. It's spring, but in other places it's not yet spring. It's dry or wet with monsoon. Or it is why is there still snow on the ground? It's strange and high, that mechanical whine in the night coming from somewhere beyond the ceiling. It's Wednesday and in another place already Thursday. It's night though here it is still half past noon. And look at the newspaper. On the upper left, a woman in a pale peach dress is smiling and waving her hand. 
On the bottom right, there's a picture of cities burning. It's spring or whatever season it is for laughter or slaughter, a difference of one letter between one state of being and another. It's that time when cows and sheep are calving, when blood is the marker for a life breaking away, or maybe just breaking. So this is my second to the last poem from the book. And uh, what you need to know is that there is an Ilocano phrase in it, which means, come back, come back, don't be afraid. Calling the soul back to the body. It swings imperceptibly on the slack end of a clothesline. Dark hooded shape, wings glossier than tree ear mushrooms, its marble eye fixed on my own. Every afternoon I come to the kitchen threshold and there it sits. I almost want to raise my right hand and swear with my left on the cover of a sacred book. It never stays long, swooping into the bush to stab a worm in half before arcing away into the sky. Vines settle back upon their blue-green cowl when it leaves. Say to the soul, I know you. Chant a spell learned long ago. My gun, my gun, dika agbutbutang. So for my last offering, I'm reading a poem I wrote in summer last year when a Filipino-American family eating at a California restaurant were the victims of a racist slur from a white man at the next table. And I want to thank Kevin McFadden for turning it into one of the beautiful broadsides produced for the festival. And this is, you can't talk to us like that. America, I've got a touch of cabin fever too and wish I could go to a favorite restaurant again. Walk down a short flight of steps into the cool brick-lined interior of what used to be a speakeasy. Wouldn't it be great to order a dozen each of the local oyster varieties, some bread and butter, a nice pull of something bubbly. We'd sing happy birthday or happy anniversary while clinking glasses and taking group pictures. But what if there's a man at a nearby table whose hatred boils over at the sight of anyone, but especially brown people like us having the gumption to reach for a little joy during this time of sickness and despair? which sometimes feels worse than death. America, he thinks we cannot be in the same room with him. So we get video rolling. We ask him to repeat the obscenities he's hurled our way so he can be held accountable and shown out of the building. We hold our ground, America. After all the years our kind broke their backs and your hard soil to bring fruit and grain to your table, just so you can put a clean white cloth and a crystal service on it. After graveyard shifts during which our kind daily tend to your sick and dying, we have the right to be here and the wages are overdue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luisa. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll welcome Ben back as well. Um, I'll invite the audience at this point to feel free to utilize the Q&A function. If you have questions you'd like me to uh, offer our, our two poets, however, I have plenty of questions of my own. Um, and I, and Luisa, I kind of want to start with you um, just because you said that very provocative statement around the idea of home, right? Right? and how home is such a tenuous space for um, writers who said, you know, like us and, and um, that language and poetry may perhaps. So I wanted you to just expand on that conversation on that, that throwaway comment just a little bit because I felt there was so much richness in there about this idea of home and perhaps um, language being part of homemaking. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Lauren. And I think it's an idea that is familiar to many of us, to all of us, I, um, even if um, home is not somewhere 6,000 miles across the globe. Anyone who has ever left a place that they consider a place of origin will feel like it is sort of impossible to go back there. You may physically go back there, and yet it will never be the same. So uh, I think especially for immigrants, for migrants, for people living in the diaspora, there's a heightened sense of that. Mm -hmm. And the idea of not just home being irretrievable, but also all of the things that that represents, like what is the family configuration? That is still something I myself in my, my own personal life, I'm trying to come to terms with that idea and what it means. So uh, I'm constantly writing about that. I'm constantly writing about plays, which in a way is a constant writing about this idea. So that's the way in which I think memory can serve us as we try to query um, new meanings for home, new meanings for belonging. And we try to look for the voices that also sing back to us in the same kinds of ways. So I hope that answers some of your questions. That's beautiful, thank you. And, and Ben, I'm gonna piggyback off of that for you because I feel like one of the, you know, I, I love, love that uh, Pennsylvania poem, all right? Um, but again, the idea of, of sort of being able to claim a space, right? Um, to, to belong, citizenship, um, and especially in the context of First Nations folks, right? Like, um, I think that's just a wonderful tension in the collection and so i just want you to expand a little bit um on how you are writing you know what it means to sort of write um and stake that claim in language yeah sure sure um man i mean louisa gave such a beautiful like you know bird's eye view macro yeah. answer um macro level answer and while she was saying that i was thinking about um so whenever I read that poem about being pepper sprayed in the face in like central Pennsylvania, right? And I, I kind of couched it as being this uh, homecoming, this like happy homecoming. And it ended up being a very painful homecoming, right? There ended up being um, a like local news article written about it. Um, and after I was pepper sprayed and after I had gotten off the street and I had showered, et cetera, or well, before I had showered and kind of gotten re-pepper re sprayed, right? Um, uh, some of my friends went to the police officers and they said, why did you do that, right? Um, this is his home, this was a homecoming, right? Um, and they are quoted as saying, um, this ain't no home for that homeboy, right? Uh, so so sometimes even where you grew up, where you know you think this is your home, right? It, it, it feels very, very foreign to you, right? You're kind of cast out of it in this way or you return and you're not welcomed. Mm -hmm. um, so for me as a writer, you know, um, you know, is my home Cuba to it? I've never been there or Japan and I, and I have never been there, right? I haven't lived for long stretches of time in upstate New York where my tribe's reservation is, right? Um, and then, where, but, but where I have lived, right, in central PA, that was very, very unwelcoming, right? So um, to answer your question as a writer, I guess I am trying to kind of complicate all those places where I think I might belong and then, you know, end up not belonging. I'm, I'm kind of trying to get away from maybe, you know, you know, clear, bright lines and kind of trouble things and muddy the kind of, you know, proverbial waters, right? Wonderful. Thank you so much. And staying with you a little bit, Ben, to the idea of um, a very violent legacy, I feel is part of what you get, uh, you really write through in Demos. And um, I have two things, masculinity and violence, right? As sort of um, two things that you're really holding um, as legacies that are, again, that you sort of want to trouble, but that also keep imposing themselves in some way. And I, I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about, um, again, I think what it means to right violence right i just think that that's always such a because the poems are beautiful but they're also saying such they're they're scripting such difficult realities right um again the language that of of the um sort of masculinist language that is thrown at the speakers the various speakers in the book um just how you reckon with those in the poems i'd love you to talk a little bit about that yeah sure sure um 
I kind of grew up in a very strange situation where both my parents were wheelbarrow factory workers um, and very, you know, blue collar, but we had this weird family legacy, right, that my great grandfather had written this kind of hybrid essay poem and been beaten for it, imprisoned for it. And so I grew up kind of thinking that poetry could be this, um, you know, powerful, affecting thing. But then I also went to uh, a kind of severely underfunded public school. So in school, poetry was this very like, you know, to, you know, nonviolent thing. Poetry was the, you know, the birch tree and the snow makes it heavy and some birds come along and right and something happens or maybe something doesn't happen. Right. Um, and so I had this very weird kind of, uh, you know, family history with poetry, but then what I was being taught was something different. And so Whenever I came to writing the, you know, writing my own poetry, uh, just like you said, I'm kind of tr I'm trying to trouble masculinity, right? To trouble violence, um, and so a lot of my work does have that kind of, um, I hope, you know, internal tension, but also external tension um, that I'm trying to kind of, uh, you know, marry with that poetic expression. Um, and yeah, to answer your question, that's kind of born from, you know. Uh, that kind of personal mythology, right? Um, which is kind of, you know, foreign to how my students might think of poetry as Dr. Seuss or exclusively right. rhyming or very, very tame, you know. Thank you, thank you. Um, Lisa, I, I, speaking of the legacy, I think when I read your collection, I think so much, I, I mean, that poem, I think it's Elegy for Lost, but there's so much, um, there's an ephemeral nature in the poems, right? That they are reaching for something that is is both there and slipping away simultaneously, right? Like there's just always elusiveness. But then I read the poems and they're so full of concrete detail, right? They're, it's so it's so rooted and also so uh, ephemeral. And I just was curious about how you um, just work to configure that 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 loss and at the same time that holding on in your writing, uh, that, that amazing and really beautiful tension. Ah, thank you for that beautiful description. And uh, it's true uh, in the descriptions of anything that is nevertheless concrete or physically material, the fact that we put words uh, in front of us to try and capture some kind of essence of the thing means that it's already one step removed from the materiality of the object. And so what more if we're writing of these intense emotional as well as larger collective or uh, historical narratives, that sense of elusiveness is also there. And it's written on the very landscape. For instance, in Baguio, there's a lot of naming that I uh, was very conscious of when I was growing up, because as a hill station, all of the street names, well, most of the street names were replaced by uh, American names. So there's Session Road, which is the main thoroughfare in the middle of the city. And it is so-called because the American colonial government sat in session there every summer. And then so there's under this though, there's like a palimpsest of other names, other realities that existed there before. So there is a street called Chanum, which means water. And that is in one of the uh, ethnic languages that are indigenous to Baguio. So uh, the sense of things being there and not there, I think we're constantly surrounded by that. And I think poetry is something that tries to capture that sense of ineffability also by both reaching for uh, a moment that is difficult to embody and trying to find maybe the best words that can come as close as we can possibly come. To, to inhabiting those moments again? That's a really deep question. I don't even know if I've been able to touch it. <laughs> that was a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. We have just a little bit of a minute left. And I guess I, I'm going to throw this to both of you about, you know, this is language as a map. And if you're thinking of, of these collections as maps for your readers, like, what do you hope they find? <laughs> Um, I guess I'll start. I hope they find themselves too. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had to write this kind of a book, certainly in order to find my way to some parts of myself that mm -hmm. I felt I hadn't really looked at in a long time, or that maybe I had only just discovered facets of that again. So it felt like I myself was making a map 
uh, for my own following, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I hope readers will also find a way to connect with themselves, even if the maps may seem like they're writing about other places that they may not have gone to before. Thank you. Oh, that's such a good answer. I want to steal that one for sure. That was, that <laughs> was an absolutely perfect answer. Um, yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. In the writing, I certainly also felt like you're kind of, um, you are doing that, right? You're that kind of self-realization, the, you know, making a map of your own, whether it's personal histories or, you know, complicating feelings, emotions, right? Uh, trying to write in those, you know, liminal spaces and trouble the waters like we've been talking about. Um, so I guess maybe to give kind of like the opposite answer, it would be, I hope they, um, you know, get lost in some ways and it's the opposite of a map, right? A map to getting like, lost, I love it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and yeah, yeah. Exactly. Thank you both so much. We are at time. It's time to wrap things up. Uh, Lisa and Benjamin, it's just always wonderful to be in, in Zoom space with you um, and your wonderful work. Um, I hope that our audience will please consider buying their featured books from your local independent bookseller or using the link that's provided in the chat um, with our partner bookseller for this event, the New Dominion Bookshop. Um, you can also check out other events in the all virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book at vabook.org. Thank you for joining us again and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you, Virginia Festival of the Book. Thank you so much.